I'll try to first define a little bit about what is uh, precision prevention. So those of you who have no, obviously have seen everybody of you that uh, learn about the precision medicine initiative and the precision medicine cohort that was announced by Obama and then Francis Collins. And so, you know, it's, it's an emerging approach for disease prevention, and that's the focus is going to be today's, is the focus on the prevention that takes into account people's individual variation in genes, environment, and, and, and lifestyle. And, and this aligns very well with the Johns Hopkins Individualized Health Initiative also, that is, uh, that is also the goal is to uh, combine clinical, genetic, and lifestyle and other data sources to create innovative tools intended to improve decision making in the prevention and treatment of a range of conditions. So, so there is a long way from going from discovery, uh, that is what you know, a lot of the time we are focusing on, to you know, biomarkers, risk factors, genetic factors, to actually making this towards going towards uh, prevention, the precision prevention. And, and there are every, every step of the way, there are many interesting methodological issues because there are very quantitative issues. And obviously, we, I will not be able to talk about all of these things in today's talk. But we, I give a you know, general overview of these you know, the various methodological issues in these various steps in this paper, which just today became online available. So if you want to uh, look at it, it's a kind of a nice coincidence. And so anyway, I have highlighted three areas which I'm going to focus on today's talk. One is that how to develop polygenic risk score using data from genome-wide association studies, synthesizing information from multiple data sources on the methodologic side. And then uh, towards the end, I'm going to talk about a particular application uh, using a breast cancer model that we have developed and how that could be potentially useful for certain clinical applications. So starting out, breast cancer, like any other complex diseases, are going to be highly polygenic. And before the era of genome-wide association studies, through studies of highly affected families and linkage studies, researchers had identified you know, rare variants which are highly penetrant. That means high, they are, their risk, if you have the variant, it's rare in the general population, but once you have the variant, the risk is very high. Those have been identified like BRCA1 and 2 genes, famous, and there are a few other variants like that. But in the last 10 years, the focus has been through the, these genome-wide association studies, which tries to identify variants which are generally more common in the general population, typically frequency more than 5% or so in the general population, and they typically confer much more modest risk. Like if you have one of these variants, their risk does not go by tenfold or fivefold, it's going by maybe 20% or even 10%. But there are many more of them that have been already found, okay? And so although each individually only confers a modest risk, in combination, they can start imposing a stronger, a stronger risk. So what is a polygenic risk score? So this is a risk score for individuals that captures the total genetic burden associated with the disease over many different variants across multiple locus. And so that's sort of, you know, you can think about instead of having a variant yes or no, it becomes more like a continuous score which counts the, the genetic load you carry over multiple different uh, with, uh, common variants. The main take home message from this that is that, that think about there's a true instrument that we cannot observe that is a true genetic risk defined by a effect of common variants, rare variants, interactions. I have left out the interactions because so far we have not seen much evidence of interactions, but there could be some contribution of interactions. And think about it, a given study, you can only construct an imperfect instrument. That is an estimate of the true genetic risk. And why is it imperfect now? Because first of all, we are missing the contribution of the rare variants because we have not done the you know, sequencing studies and things like that in a large scale yet. And, but even for common variants, we cannot estimate their effects for the, of each variant perfectly because of the statistical imprecision. You know, whatever very large data set we have, we still have uncertainty in estimating these small effects, which are near zero, but we would like to have a very tight confidence intervals around, that, uh, around those effect sizes. So as a result, we fall short. We cannot reach the limit in the current uh, sample sizes. So in the future, we'll need very large sample sizes, whole genome sequencing to get to the, you know, the contribution of the rare variants, Hopefully, some good functional annotation data could also help to prioritize the SNPs, because so far what I'm talking about is based on all agnostic approach that we treat all SNPs equally, but if there is a better way of prioritizing SNPs, that might improve the risk prediction. I'm going to give an, one example. And then we need robust statistical method to put all of this information uh, together. So here's the, like the, the methodology we have developed, which I, I really like, is you know, that's a geometric view of what we have done. So typically what we are trying to do is that we are trying to develop a predictive model of a, say, predict an outcome Y, given a set of risk factors X and a Z. And you know, we have a parametric model, 
And typically, that we try to fit a model in this space because you know we have data analytic studies. I do standard maximum likelihood or estimating equation approach or whatever. This is our standard practice currently. But now suppose somebody has, from an external big data sources, somebody has fitted a reduced model. That means they have, have developed a model for predicting y based on a subset of the risk factors, which in this case is x. Okay, and that, that has their own parametric model, and you know, and maybe that you know nobody has given me the data, but they have given me the what is the parameter estimate from that big big model. That, so the model fitted to the big data, which is a reduced model fitted to the big data. So the question is, how do I in take advantage of this information when I'm trying to make inference on this, on this space? So, so here is what the, our view is. that So there is a true parameter that is generating the true probability distribution of the data, and that's what we're trying to estimate. And that's what we'd like to get an estimate of the parameters. But that gives a, like if you think about that, that true probability distribution uh, if you project it to the, the, the reduced model space, that gives rise to a corresponding true probability distribution for the, in the reduced model space. And what I have is that, and that, that model, the true pro, when you project this from here to here, that probability may not belong to the parametric family of models that have been considered in the past, but that's still okay. okay? But what we know is that, that, you know, that, that the, if, if somebody has done a maximum likelihood estimation, there is a nice theory of like, how, what does the property of maximum likelihood estimation under the specification of the model that says that, that whatever the parameter estimate that they have gotten, that should sort of minimize in some sense the distance between this space and the true distribution, or the true distribution of the projection of this distribution to the lower, that, that, that space. So the basic idea is that that means that you, know, you can put the, all this geometry I said, you can put it as a mathematical constraint on the, on, this, on the parameters of this model. But now let's get to be more concrete that suppose now I think of a particular application Let's suppose, you know, we, can we use this kind of model, or if we try to use this model for deciding when a woman might be recommended for screening, as opposed to the, following the current guideline, which is simply based on age. So, for example, in the US, currently the guideline for starting mammographic screening is considered age 50, and, and actually for many diseases and many cancer, age is the use as the, the threshold for screening. But why do we use age? Because age is the strongest risk factor for many chronic diseases, and that's a, the best risk marker we have. But age is not the only risk factor. There could be other risk factors. And the question is that if we use a risk-based approach, which is going to be more coherent, instead of the age, how much things will change? So that's what we wanted to uh, answer you know, using this model. So what we are ask, asking this question in this table is that, suppose we give this model to estimate you know, to risk for 100,000 women in the general uh, population. Okay, And let's focus on the third and the fourth row. So what I'm showing is that, that if, I, if I assess the risk for 100,000 women who are currently at age 40, how many people's risk, the 10 year risk is going to be an av over an average 50 year old woman's risk. Why am I using 50? Because 50 is the current recommendation for screening, right? So you can think about if you are coherent, if you can find some woman who has less a family history and high genetic risk, and who are at age 40, their risk is looks like an average 50 year old woman. Then based on a risk-based approach, they should be recommended for screening. And the question I'm asking is that how many people we can identify based on this kind of modeling. So you can see that the, if you use a full model of the SNP and risk factors, out of the 100,000 people, about 16% of that population who are at 40, they should be recommended for screening because their risk is actually like a 50-year-old woman. And if I ask the other question, like you know, how many, if we assess the risk for a 50-year-old woman and how many of them are actually risk is like a 40-year-old woman, that means they're actually lower risk, and you'll see that, that that fraction is even larger. That's almost like you know, one third of the population who are currently at age 50, but their risk is actually like, you know, at a, at a 40 year old woman. And so, and this final column shows like, you know, for example, if you do this 16,000 additional screening, how many cases will capture? Okay, so we'll capture about 600 cases. The number is still small because, you know, the, the probability of developing breast cancer in the next 10 years is still a small number. So that's why, but you, by doing this additional screening for this 40 year woman, the 16,000 women, you might get this 600, you can capture 600 additional cases. So the cost benefit will really depend on a lot on the, also the how much cost it, you know, it involves to assess the model. For example, if the genetic testing is too expensive, then to do this additional screening and then to save this many, maybe additional diagnosis, 50, 600 cases to screen 100,000 women, that might be the cost benefit may not be that much. But if the genetic testing cost really drops, then this cost benefit might be actually like, you know, useful. And on the other side is that, you know, that if we screen 32,000 people, delay the screening for this 
you know, this, this 50-year-old woman because their risk is low. And, you know, there's a lot of people, and we'll, we'll obviously miss some cases, right? Because, we, because they could be potential diagnosis, so we'll miss some cases. But you see that, in a, that this is the number of cases we'll, we'll miss, and, you know, by, by not screening those, uh, this woman. Another thing we wanted to investigate is that, the, that the, the part, in terms of risk communications. So a lot of the factors that went into the risk model, what we considered not modifiable, like, for example, genetics and, you know, like height and other factors. And so in terms of risk communication, we thought like, you know, that, you know if a woman finds out, you know, they have a high genetic risk, right? And, and that's not itself is modifiable. But the question is that, you know, that, that how much of the risk could be modifiable due to the lifestyle factors? And, you know, and whether we can look into that more at an individual basis that is, that is defined based on their genetic uh, profile. So what we are do showing is that the, the absolute risk distributions in a little different way. So first we categorize like women uh, based on the deciles of their non-modifiable risk. A lot of it is defined by, for example, the, the, the polygenic risk score. Okay, so for example, if some woman gets genetic testing, they test for these 100 SNPs, and they come up with the risk, the genetic risk, and based on that, we can define, okay, somebody's with a low risk, you know, the first deciles, the median deciles, or the high risk, okay? But that is the risk, they cannot do anything about it, right? And then what I, in that axis, this axis, what I'm showing is that within these categories, there are variation in risk because of their environmental factors, the lifestyle factors. But I'm showing how much variation is risk is there due to the, the four lifestyle factors we are considering within categories of this non-modifiable risk. And what is striking here is that, that you can see that, 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 that there's a lot more variation in risk due to the lifestyle factors among people who are due to high risk due to the, these genetics and other non-modifiable factors. So for example, I mean, these are the you know, people who are at the high genetic risk and, you know, and they are bad lifestyle, like a you know, heavy drinker, smoking, obese and using HRT, compared to that, you know, if you have a, the best lifestyle, you have a very substantial spread in, the, in, the, in this risk. Like, and in fact, the, even if you are at a high genetic risk, like the deciles, if you have the right lifestyle, you are kind of on the average, you know, you, you can achieve at the average, that is what is the average risk for the, for the population. I mean, you will not be like these people, like who are lucky to be born with the best set of genes so that their risk is already low and they can further reduce it. But the, the point is that even people who have high genetic risk, they have even a higher potential to reduce in terms of absolute risk reduction to do the, you know, do the right thing and bring down their risk at the average uh, level. So we think that there is a, some like a hopeful message here is that, you know, that the, this kind of communication might maybe more, you know, helpful to motivate some people to make the right lifestyle choices. Although we know that everybody should make these lifestyle choices, but it, it, motivation is hard. But the question is that, you know, that this might be a way of communicating risk that could be uh, helpful.